And we're talking, as you can see where I'm starting in the Vicksburg campaign, we're talking about the second half of the war. So after Ulysses S. Grant, Sherman, and, you know, the other Union forces all compo uh, you know, conduct this campaign, eventually Vicksburg Falls, and that's going to free up some more Union armies while at the same time um, providing fewer Confederate forces throughout the field. Of course, uh, you're before long going to have fighting in Middle Tennessee. Of course, you're going to have the Battle of Chickamauga. You're going to have Chattanooga, and that will set up the Atlanta campaign. So now we're talking about the spring of 1864 already. Um, I think you know about the Atlanta campaign, Rocky Face Ridge, Resaca, Pickett's Mill, uh, uh, Dallas New Hope, uh, Kennesaw Mountain, and all these others. And this is going on in, like I said, the spring um, and into the early summer and then beyond of 1864. Now, while those armies are moving south toward Atlanta, further south, the Confederates only have so many forces available to defend one of their most important ports. Of course, this is Mobile Bay. I mean, we're going to talk later, or you're going to deal later. The Confederates and Yankee soldiers will deal later with Fort Fisher. But for now, Mobile Bay is a very important target of the Union's South Atlantic blockading squadron. You know there's going to be a big battle there in early August of 1864. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. But even though the Union is not only successful in entering the bay and completely subduing um, the naval resistance, but eventually also capturing Fort Gaines and Fort Morgan on both sides of it. But as you see in the next slide, capturing Mobile Bay, which is huge, by the way, if you've ever tried to drive around it the two and a half hours or so to get around the thing, um, you know this is big. And that does nothing in the end to help capture the important port of Mobile, Alabama. So that's going to have to wait a little bit longer. So the fight is down there at the yellow star at the bottom. Of course, the fight will later be decided for Mobile the following spring at places like Spanish Fort and Fort, Fort Blakely. Now, while this stuff is going on around Mobile, Alabama, there's also a lot going on around Richmond, Virginia. I think you're familiar with it. It's called the Overland Campaign. So while Sherman is marching toward Atlanta and while uh, Union forces are trying to capture Mobile, uh, Mobile Bay at least, Forts Morgan and uh, Gaines, you have U.S. Grant and his army group actually going up against Robert E. Lee in the famous battles you know all about, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, um, North Anna, uh, Totopotomy, Hushop, Cold Harbor, and Petersburg. And a lot of people think it was just a linear fight, that they went from one place to another, and once the armies left the Richmond area, you see that around Totopotomy, you see Richmond on the map. Once they moved on to Petersburg, the fight simply moved there. That's not the case, of course. Um, every time the Union moves further south around Petersburg, they correspondingly launched attacks north of the James River between Richmond and Petersburg. That's things you've heard of, like the Battle of Swift Creek Mill and um, the first deep bottom, second deep bottom, and then this series of actions in late September of 1864 at Newmarket Heights and here at Chaffin's Bluff or Chaffin's Farm. You've heard us talk about this before. You can actually see some of the action here uh, and some of what we preserved over near uh, Confederate Fort Gregg. Now, the main thing you got to know is that the Union made some gains at Newmarket Heights, which is off this map to the south about a mile or two. Um, and then here at Chaffin's Farm, I mean, this is heady stuff. Had the Union broken through here, they're, they've got roads directly to Richmond. Um, so the Confederates are fighting for their lives here. They lose Fort Harrison that you see at the bottom of the map. It is one of the best preserves preserved of all the Richmond forts. Super cool. And we are able to add on to it uh, with dozens of acres, actually, if we're able to be successful here and better connect this closer to Fort Johnson and Fort Gregg and Fort Gilmer. Um, you guys know how we do this in puzzle pieces. So we've got New York and Pennsylvania troops. We got United States color troops. And although the USCT were not involved in the fight for Fort Harrison, they would later rename Fort Harrison, now off to the bottom of the map here, they would rename it Fort Burnham because Harrison was a Confederate, Burnham is a Union soldier, um, and then they're going to encamp there. You have several USCT units um, encamped right around here, and it becomes one of the best photographed uh, of all of Richmond's forts, Fort Harrison, Fort Brady, and uh, Drury's Bluff or Fort Darling. Um, are the best photographed places. We have great resources. We know what this area looked like. We know who's, when, where. Now, the Confederates, although they lost Fort Harrison, were able to simply dig um, entrenchments, a new line, or improve a new line that they already had further in the back there. So the Union still has a lot of fighting to do. Now, note that the fall of Mobile Bay, the push for and eventually captured capture of Atlanta, this fight where they're getting close in toward uh, Richmond. Plus, at the same time, you've got Phil Sheridan in September um, moving to try to clear the valley of not only Confederate resistance, but everything of use. Uh, and you're familiar with this. Third Winchester, uh, Fisher's Hill, Tom's Brook and Cedar Creek. 
uh, the Union will demonstrate a complete dominance of the valley and then engage in the burning um, uh, at that, that around that time of the valley. And all these things really make no mistake. It's Atlanta looms the largest, but all these things helped Abraham Lincoln to be reelected, continue the war. Had he lost, you know, McClellan was running on a peace platform. Who knows what would have happened? So here we are with a good opportunity at Chapin's Bluff. Now, as I noted earlier, they're not only fighting between Richmond and Petersburg, these two lines that you see right here, but they're also trying to continually move around to the south, okay? And they're not only trying to get south of Petersburg, you're familiar with some of these actions, but they're trying to move further west, interdicting and cutting Confederate railroads as they're going to move further and further southwest of Petersburg, okay? And by the uh, fall of 1864, at this same time, around uh, in advance of the election, you've got an important battle at the Battle of Peebles Farm. OK, now Peebles Farm is a threefer. OK, there's going to be a battle here at the end of September 1864. It's going to take place, as you see here on this map. This very battle allows the Union to establish this line of green that you see there. That's National Park Service land. All the blue, of course, is what you've helped us to preserve around there. And you're able to see um, uh, this sort of line of green is the works that they were able to establish as a result. So this is the Union soldiers getting a foothold further southwest of Petersburg, getting ever closer to the key Boyden Plank Road and the railroads that sat behind it. So the Confederates are getting pushed up to their last ditch here by late fall of 1864. Now, on the way to reinforce um, the Confederate line and, and sally forth against the Union, who's trying to you know capture this Confederate line at the bottom of the map, they're going to pass by this track that we're also trying to preserve. Um, this is the Banks House. Uh, this is a mid-18th century house, that's the one on the right, connected to a later 18th century house. You've got two 18th century houses, or, or I guess the big one is an addition to it. Um, just sitting there, uh, and the Confederates moved by it, it would have been a witness to the Battle of uh, uh, Peebles Farm. It would have been a battle, um, a witness to a future battle as well that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Now, for those of you who have been around Petersburg and Pamplin Park, let me just note, of course, this is I-85 and, uh, and Route 1. They're all interchanging right around here. And what you're seeing is an aerial view of some pretty heavy industrial areas. However, the ground just to the south of here is all Pamplin Historical Park. There's National Park Service land. There's American Battlefield Trust land there. So it might seem like this area around the um, around this is gone, but there are little pockets. If I go back a couple, you can see here that it's not that far from Pamplin Historical Park in Brown, okay? And Pamplin Park um, approached us and asked us if we would acquire um, a, a nice tract with some real acreage. You see what I'm circling right here in a, you know, sort of amidst the sea of development. But as you'll see here, I mean, this is a pocket park here. Uh, this is an 18th century structure. There's a lot of stories to tell. I'll tell them a little bit more, or I'll tell at least one of them a little bit later. But you can see they've, they're preserving some key ground, and nothing would exactly stop um, somebody from developing it if they were able to purchase from Pamplin Historical Park. They wanted us to get involved. They're going to continue to run it, and we're able to use our grants and, and uh, other generosity in order to preserve this place because we have been concerned about Pamplin Park for a long time. The, the main battlefield is not under a complete easement that we would consider preserved. Now, let's fast forward. This was the fall of uh, 1864. Let's move forward to March of 1865. Some of you already recognize this as the Battle of Fort Stedman, the last grand attack of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. This is John B. Gordon lashing out with 20,000 soldiers toward what they hoped was a weak point in the Union line and through which they could exploit and disrupt Union operations in the rear, maybe creating enough time for Robert E. Lee's army to leave Richmond and Petersburg, evacuate it, and get into the open field where Lee was much more effective fighting. Because the uh, Union came back and pushed back against the Confederates, they're going to win the Battle of Fort Stedman, and that's going to create weaknesses on other part of the Confederate line, namely back where we were just talking about, the Threefer. And in the first battle was Peebles Farm. The second one is called Jones Farm. I don't have that map with me now, but the Union is going to push forward here on Church Road, still a road today. And they're going to push forward on both sides and capture a key Confederate picket line. Where's this Confederate picket line? Well, right on the land we saved. In other words, it's right here where the Sea of Blue is, okay? The Sea of Blue is later going to use that for their grand attack a week or two later when they engage in what we now know as the breakthrough. And that's the map you're seeing here. So again, this is thrice hallowed ground 
um, from Peebles Farm, Jones Farm, and now the breakthrough battlefield. So the Union was able to get closer. The Confederates had to establish a picket line much closer to their main line that you see here inside Pamplin Historical Park. You know the stories. Uh, there's some Maryland troops. There's famously a Vermont guy named Gould, and he you know goes on top of the parapet. He might be one of the first ones to break through. He's bayoneted. He's shot, and he's still fighting with the Confederates. He will be awarded the Medal of Honor there as well. And this is one of the largest attacks of the entire Civil War. Uh, we're talking about 16,000 soldiers. There's so many attacks that are not as well known as Pickett's Charge which it, with its 12,500 soldiers. But um, I don't know of an attack more consequential than this one. This one results directly in the fall of the Confederate capital. And you've helped us to save a good portion of this battlefield. You see this Park Service land down here, Fort Welsh, Fort Gregg, Fort Fisher. Um, we, uh, you know, have been able to preserve land all around it until we're picking off even little houses in the middle, puzzle pieces again to get it. Now, somebody asked in the questions, if, I hope you don't mind me answering now, can you access Pamplin Park through the trails around Fort Fisher? The answer is as of at least a year and a half ago, yes. In other words, you, you were able to provide us with the funding to lay out a trail in 2015 that starts behind Fort Fisher on trust land, and then it goes on to the on to the National Park Service land, goes to F Fort Welsh, goes across the breakthrough battlefield, covering all three battles there, and then it connects with Pamplin Park's trails that'll take you toward the visitor center. Now, that was doable as of a year and a half ago. I'm not aware that they've changed it. They want you to pay the fee. That's not new. Um, they've always wanted you to proceed to the visitor center and pay the fee. If they blocked it off, it's news to me. It would be best to call them before you go. Now, after the Union broke through here, they went in both directions. Smart attack. Don't just break through the enemy line. Have a plan. So you see a lot of troops going off to the left um, to undo the Confederate lines along a water course called Hatcher's Run. And then you see some other troops going to the right. And that's going to be expanded where John Gibbons' troops will come in. Okay, And they're going to engage in the high watermark of the Confederacy, the Battle of Fort Gregg. It's, I'm sorry, sorry, it's called the Confederate Alamo because 300 Confederates held off more than 10,000 Union soldiers who we're trying to dash into Petersburg before the Confederates can uh, escape uh, or evacuate. Now you see them, uh, the Union Six Corps troops going directly over um, the Banks House there after this battle. And you can see it here. Um, they're behind the Confederate lines. AP Hill is killed on track on land you helped us to preserve right off to the left here. Um, things are going terribly for the Confederates at this point. And you can see that the Banks House is directly in the path here of the Confederate retreat and the Union advance. Now, back to the Banks House, uh, you know, all of a sudden, General U.S. Grant makes his headquarters here. Um, after the breakthrough. So this is not only important and not only old, but Grant himself, commander of all the Union armies. In fact, are you looking, when I look a little bit closer, I think I see somebody on the porch there. Yeah, there's Grant actually standing in the base uh, at, the, at the Banks house, a verified 100% uh, true photograph, I know. Um, and then, of course, we're still not done because this fighting around Richmond um, in uh you know, March and early April of 1865, the breakthrough is on April 2nd, as Robert E. Lee and his troops are fleeing to, uh, westward to try to hook up with Joe Johnston, that's going to result in Appomattox, okay? In the meantime, the fight is going back to Mobile Bay as promised, okay? So there's going to be fighting at a place called Spanish Fort on April 8th, the day before Robert E. Lee surrenders. The Confederates are outnumbered there, something like 11 to 1. Dabney Maury can't hold on, and, um, you know, a Union general named Canby, after fighting New Mexico and other places has a lot, uh, you know, of experience, and he has a huge group of sixteen thousand soldiers arrayed to attack the Confederate positions here at Fort. Blakely, okay? Confederates have nine redoubts or so, but they only have 3,500 soldiers. The Union has 16,000. You do the math, and on the same day that Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox, 16,000 Union soldiers move forward in one of the largest attacks of the Civil War, and one of the quickest. This was a 35-minute battle, um, and we are able to get more of the Confederate line. Now, all the brown that you see here is a beautiful park, um, the Blakely, historic Blakely State Park. It is a combined park. People can camp, people can access and uh, enjoy the Tensaw River. And there's a lot of great history there, both interpretive signage, there's some monuments, there's an old cemetery. They're, they're interpreting more than 100 years of history 
at this place. So it's it's really great. And they're great stewards of all the land. You can see that we've already transferred over to them. We again have USCTs um, actually fighting on this tract. I think I'll show you a close up later, but here's some of the park, one of the redoubts in the middle. You can see the Tensaw River. Um, it's beautiful. It's a hidden gem when you're anywhere near Mobile or Pensacola. It is worth a visit. Here's some pictures I took on my last visit there. I think I've been there four times now and it never gets old. It is. A lot of their stuff is in a great state of preservation with a little bit of restoration mixed in there. And you can see another huge dozens of acres uh, track that we're able to get to continue to really build in the puzzle pieces here and especially getting the Confederate left flank and the Union right composed almost entirely 